a very informal conversation. We've got a couple repeat uh, customers here coming back. So great to, uh, to see the folks that are, that are coming back. We usually open with a poll, LinkedIn poll, which um, actually want to pull that up right now. And as I'm pulling it up, just as a reminder, we record this. So uh, don't want to share anything you don't want out in the wild. Uh, so let me share this week's poll. And oops, let me pull up the poll here. Just bear with me. All right. Uh, so this week's poll, we asked about where people were succeeding or where they were having challenges in account-based marketing. And obviously nobody wants to talk about failure, but the fact of the matter is uh, um, all of us have seen account-based marketing successes and not successes. So uh, the question that I asked was where specifically are people seeing some challenges in terms of ABM programs not succeeding? And um, I guess a little bit of a surprise uh, from my perspective and that so many people, first of all, voted. Uh, so that was a bit of a surprise. And the majority really voted for the sales and marketing alignment, which um, I would have expected a little bit more even distribution, but I guess I'm a little bit out of touch. I know we've been, we've been talking about sales and marketing alignment. Uh, Megan, I think your old company made a business doing that. Um, but uh, we've been talking about it for 20 years and it still, still is in the kind of in the same spot. But what, what was your reaction to this? Just out of curiosity. I'm pretty sure that's how I voted. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, it makes me sad because as you said, we've all been working on this for so long. You'd think we have it figured out. But um, unfortunately, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of disconnection. And some of it, by the way, is not, it's not like it's marketing good sales bad, right? When we see lack of sales and marketing alignment, I see... Um, things that are not productive on both sides of, of the, the aisle, so to speak. Um, and I think it often comes from a lack of clarity around a shared goal. Um, and that's, you know, part of why I'm super excited to have our guest, John Miller here today, um, who I've had the pleasure of working with and, and uh, knowing for quite some time and super excited to have him talk with us, I think about um, a concept that is helping to sort of bridge that gap, I feel like. And, and John would love, you know, for you just to um, share with us a little bit about kind of your current journey and, and thinking about um, ABX versus ABM and, and kind of how that's maybe helping to alleviate some of the sales and marketing alignment. And, and I'd love to hear your vote too. What do you think in terms of what causes ABM programs to not succeed? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny how survey design affects the answer sometimes, right? I mean, when you, but I can only pick one. <laughs> I would definitely pick sales and marketing alignment, uh, you know, but the other one that was in my head pretty hard was, you know, just lack of company alignment on how to measure success. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've definitely seen that one too, where marketers get in trouble, you know, kind of not convincing the rest of the E-team that, you know, quantity mes based metrics are going to go away. But if you only got one, sales and marketing alignment. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I like that. So it's survey design as as predictor of destiny. <laughs> so you're, uh, I mean, you're obviously uh, uh, alluding to, you know, what I've been talking about is account-based experience, you know, or, or ABX. Um, so for those, I mean, I, I'm recognizing about half the names and faces here. So hi, hi to the folks that I know. That's good to see you and talk to you. <laughs> and um, you know, hope you participate in the conversation. Some of you probably have read what I've already talked about or heard me talk about ABX. So I won't go on it for too, too long. But you know, I've been thinking a lot about kind of what made kind of you know the goodness of traditional demand generation, you know, the stuff that we were doing 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> and what was so nice about it is, you know, back in my Marketo days, we talked about, you know, we weren't gonna send the lead to sales until they were ready, which meant salespeople didn't have to talk to people who didn't want to talk to them. And buyers didn't get unwanted phone calls, right? And that was, that was awesome, right? You know, and then we all started preaching all this ABM stuff, you know, which was awesome in its own way because it was so targeted and focused and really went after those big guys who weren't responding to our campaigns, you know? But I think as a lot of companies, including my own, were practicing it, you know, we were basically reaching out to companies regardless of whether the timing was right for them to be interested in hearing from us. And we tried to do it in a relevant way and we tried to be personalized and all sorts of good things. 
But fundamentally, we had lost that kind of connection of only call people when they actually want to talk to you. And it, it felt like traditional ABM wasn't creating a very good customer experience. Um, and so I started thinking about, okay, is there something that can blend the precision and targeting of ABM with the experience, the positive experience of traditional demand gen? And just decided to call it account-based experience, partly because the ABX acronym is just kind of cool uh, and, and, and fun to say. But the other advantage of the ABX acronym and the account-based experience name is it takes marketing out of the name. And you know, many of you have known, I've been trying to do that for years, whether it's account-based everything or you know, some other name for this whole stuff. Um, and I think that's a good thing too, because we, we, we just, we can't, you know, how many analysts have contorted themselves calling it account-based strategies and just using account-based as an adjective, uh, <laughs> trying to avoid calling it account-based marketing. Uh, so that, you know, per se. So that's what, it, that's what account-based experience is meant to be. Um, and would love to kind of chat about, you know, what other people think about the implications of that, you know, can, can you know, what, is it, what does it mean to sort of want to go after accounts, you know, but also respect the fact that they don't want us to go after them until they're ready and all that kind of stuff. John, I got a quick question on how you've uh, framed that up. And again, thank you for joining early morning here and uh, really, really excited to have you join us today. Okay. Um, when you talk about experience, of course, um, my immediate reaction is customer experience. And then just thinking about almost like an ABM maturity curve of first aligning sales and marketing, which obviously is a pain point given the, the, the uh, survey and then customer experience kind of bolted on. Are you seeing a trend of people uh, starting to involve customer experience a lot more as part of this ABX, or do you feel like it's still primarily concentrated in sales and marketing and getting that experience down um, and, and then hopeful to get the customer experience? Yeah. So, I mean, as I'm defining ABX, it's not meant to be exclusive to the post-sale customer experience. You know, I, I definitely am talking about the, the experience across the entire life cycle, you know, and the entire journey. Um, in terms of your specific question, though, I, I think it's evolving slowly. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, obviously, there's, you know, I mean, I've seen the research from, from the ABL, ABMLA benchmark, you know, that basically talks about, you know, the one-to-one -one style of ABM, strategic ABM, tends to be like 80% focused on existing customers. You know, one to few tends to be about 50-50 between new business and existing customers. Uh, one to many tends to be more like 75 new 25, you know, existing. And so I think a lot of it has to do less than like a trend and more just like, what's the, what's the style of ABM you're practicing? What are your deal sizes? Right. I mean, again, if you're Accenture and you're selling $500 million a year contracts, you've already got a relationship with that company, <laughs> you know, like that you're, you're, you're selling that too. So, it, you know, so all, as I said, all that said, I do think it's evolving slowly. Um, you know, and it evolves back to the metrics point, I think as marketers compensation changes, you know, as, as, as long, if you're a marketing team that gets paid for, or measured on pipeline, new, new business pipeline, you know, it's just, it, it, it won't change. Right. And, and until the way people measure marketing to include expansion and cross sell or other customer metrics, um, marketers are going to do what they're measured on. Megan muted. Um, you'd think after all these months, I would get that right. Um, so I'm curious to know what you think it's going to take to get um, essentially executive teams, right? And CEOs to change their mind about how to evaluate marketing. I, I'm curious, like, I, I do want to hear what yeah. other people are seeing and experiencing. I mean, yeah. I, I have not felt like the resistance is coming from any person as opposed to just inertia. Mm. I, you know, if a CMO stands up and says, hey, measure me on customer pipeline too, I don't think anybody's going to say, well, that's stupid, right? But neither, but I don't think the push for it is coming from outside of the marketing departments yet either. Yeah, so that's an interesting one. Are, are we truly our own worst enemy in that case, right? If we persist in saying, well, because we can measure MQLs, that's what, that's what we're going to you know, claim victory on. 
Um, as opposed to, I think I hear a lot of fear from marketers thinking that they're not going to be able to explain why a different kind of measurement would be just as meaningful in terms of their contribution to the business. Um, they're kind of in, um, they're kind of using the uh, the story in my head thing, right? The story in my head is that my CEO and my CFO are going to laugh me out of the room if I say measure me on something else. Yeah. Um, but well, the reality is, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. Maybe we're stopping that conversation when we should be having it. But I'm I'm very curious to hear from folks on the line too. Um, what do you think? If I can just throw out a real point real fast. I, I do think that, you know, I'm maybe oversimplified a little bit. I mean, obviously, if you just say measure pipeline, like pipelines, at least a, a common measurement across everything, you know, cross sell pipeline, like they don't, a lot of people don't really care if it's cross sell pipeline or new business pipeline, right? You know, but, but the problem is when you work backwards from pipeline, yeah. you know, and we don't have those leading indicators yet, I think, for expansion. And, and for the customer side of things. And I think that is another barrier. Yeah. Are you seeing many companies kind of progress the way that they're measuring? I mean, I know, um, you know, obviously your company and your platform help people with that. You know, what are some interesting things that you're seeing in terms of changes there or trends? For, I mean. For measurement. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing is, um, you know, people adopting some flavor of an engagement metric. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it, that does seem to be, uh, catch gone or have caught on kind of depending how you think about it, you know, and, and, but, you know, as you know, a couple of years ago, I was a big proponent of just like, Hey, engagement minutes, you know, if, if there's more engagement happening, then that's a good thing. Actually, I, I don't see that as often as like the real core metric. What I see more is people defining engagement based account stages and then measuring kind of movement. You know, so, hey, I have a thousand target accounts, you know, and last quarter, 200 of them, you know, had their their initial engagement with me, you know, and 48 of them became MQAs or marketing qualified accounts. So it's still based on leading indicators on engagement, but it's, um, it's a little bit more concrete to how people think about things. Um, And I think it can work for, uh, for post sale if you kind of define those stages right. Yeah. Linda, you read my mind on that question. Um, Linda's asking um, about talking to customers at the right time when they're open to talking to you. And and is that the same thing as intent signals showing you the right time to contact a customer? And, And I was thinking about the same thing. What if too, there's kind of another variation on that theme. What, what if you sell something that is more of a new concept, right? And, and it isn't necessarily the case that people would be showing you signals. You know, I'd, I'd love for you to, um, talk to talk to Linda's question, but then I'm also curious to hear what you're seeing in terms of companies who have a little bit more of a new concept or a new paradigm yeah. type of sale yeah. and, and how they're leveraging intent or other ways to know when people might be more open. Yeah. I mean, so yes, I think intent signals, broadly speaking, are kind of how you start to try to figure out the right time. The reason I say intent signals, broadly speaking, is because I mean both kind of first party and third party intent signals. Um, you know, third party intent signals or what are they doing out on the web, right? Are they researching stuff? Are they downloading content? You know, um, and obviously we even have some folks online who are experts in that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that can be really, but what's cool about that third party intent is it does two things. One, there's sort of like a baseline level, right? Hey, this company just tends to read about this kind of stuff, right? And that can actually be interesting for picking your target accounts. But then there's also the rate of change or the first derivative on that. And when you see movement in it, that can sort of be a sign of something being different in kind of the, the, the buying cycle. But first party data is really important too. You know, and as much as people talk about buyers wanting to stay anonymous and yes, more research is, not, is happening off of our site, we're all pretty good at also still getting people to fill out forms or click on emails at some point and being able to, to, you know, there are people in our database that we are, and we can track first party information also. And it's really, you know, this combination of those signals that I think is kind of how you start to figure out the right time. But to the second part of Megan's question, you know, is just because I'm saying we're not calling people until they're ready, that doesn't mean that we're ignoring them. You know, um, and there are still ways that we can, I think, you know, try, I mean, the whole point of marketing is to, you know, help build awareness and, um, 
and, and ultimately preference, you know, in the target accounts, you know, and so that can be, I mean, just as simple as an advertising campaign, you know, I mean, just build, <laughs> building awareness for your problem and your, and your solution. You know, I, I really like to talk about, you know, at the very, very top of the journey, just, hey, this is an account I would like to sell to you, but they have just no clue about us or our problem. Like, that's where you need to rely on emotion more than logic. You know, it, 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 it's, you're, you are literally doing the most basics of brand building. Um, you know, if they start to kind of like show a little of intent, a little bit of engagement, I think that's where you can sort of do the traditional stuff that we all know how to do from demand gen, like thought leadership. It's, you know, it's moving from emotion to logic and really starting to educate and influence and guide. But again, don't call, <laughs> you know, like, like, like don't do interruption oriented tactics uh, until you sort of get some sign that, hey, it might be the right time to reach out. So, it's, you know, that's sort of what I mean by experience. It's just about respecting where they are in their journey and then sort of aligning what you, how you're interacting with them, you know, to the right time. You know, another like direct mail is another example. You know, I'm all for, I mean, we do this, you know, we're going to send a copy of my book to execs at like a thousand different, you know, target accounts. Um, you know, so they may not even have heard of demand base or be aware of us, but, but, you know, it's a way to sort to build, start to build a relationship and a connection. What we're not going to do is say, hey, I have a book for you, or I have some gift for you, take a meeting and I'll send it to you, <laughs> you know, which by the way, it might be the right strategy if they're in an MQA stage, you know, but, but uh, it's, it's a little too aggressive when it's in the earlier stages. So that's uh, how I would think about if you have a product that doesn't, that people aren't yet searching for, you know, it's, it's still kind of respect where they are in the experience. Yeah, it was fun. We had uh, Heidi Bullock on last week and she was talking about, you know, we were asking her a bit about the role of brand in ABM. And I think it's, it's interesting to see. I've, I've seen a couple of pieces on that recently about the role of brand and sort of the role of awareness and sort of not ignoring that part of the funnel, because that's sort of what gets you permission to play. Um, and then after that, you know, you start to be able to engage people through some of the traditional demand gen tactics, but definitely have seen a bit of a resurgence for interest in the top of the funnel. And then, as you say, sort of following the breadcrumbs, I just put a link to your book in the chat. If people haven't seen this, um, it's really good. And, and John, you got a nice compliment from um, one of my colleagues over in Europe, a, a new marketing leader um, for the European part of the team. And um, she was interested in learning about all things AVM. So she went and did some homework. And what was the first thing that she's just like, look what I found. And she was so excited and she thought it was great stuff. So uh, thank you for the no form link. <laughs> That's great. Um, kind of a, a nice bonus for this crew, but yeah, anyway, but it's, um, it's really good stuff. So I'm kind of thinking about the the book, you know, sort of the recent book, and then thinking about changes from the last go around. What are some of the things that changed the most from your first book to the second one? You know, sort of first clear and complete guide to the second one. Yeah, this is technically the third edition, really. Oh, wow. Um, you know, because I wrote one back in 2016, and then we expanded it a lot, I think in 18, and then this one. Um, well, so... It's, yeah, I mean, a good question. I think, you know, uh, a couple things that have evolved, obviously introduction of account-based experience. Um, I think much more refined view of the account journey mm -hmm. and, and the role of predictive analytics in the account journey. Intent is playing a bigger role. Um, I think the, it's funny, back in 2016, orchestration was an idea and I wanted to write about it. And I honestly didn't really know what to say <laughs> you know, that much about what did account-based orchestration mean. And by now, like we know the plays and here's the playbooks and here's so much more sophisticated section. But the other section that's changed a lot since the last guide um, is how I've been thinking about advertising. And, you know, that could be seen as self-serving because now I work at a company that sells advertising. Uh, but actually <laughs> that was me kind of getting more educated. You know, I, you know, back, back in the day, I was a pretty big skeptic about display. You know, kind of the whole, hey, who the hell clicks on ads? I don't click on ads. You click on ads. Um, and I would even run some tests, you know, and like had shown like, hey, this advertising stuff doesn't work that well. Um, and I, I, I have changed my tune, you know, A, in terms of when I, you know, being able to really see that when advertising is done well, it absolutely creates increases in traffic and engagement for the accounts. So, you know. 
uh, my, 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 my tune has changed and I also admit my bias on that. So. <laughs> yeah. Could you expand on what you mean by done well? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it without sounding too demand-based commercially. Um, the, the, the trick with B2B advertising, there's two things you got to sort of solve. Um, well, sorry, I'll over, I'm over the bike. There's three. The first is you got to know if this person on that page, what account they work for. So you need really good account identification. Second, and you know, some vendors are better at that than others, but second, more subtly, is you need to balance the ads across the accounts in the target list. And usually the number of ads that an account gets is proportional to the number of cookies or people at that account because the DSPs aren't built with an account lens in mind. So all it knows is individual cookies. And so if you're targeting Walmart and Land's End, what's, what's gonna happen all too often is Walmart will get a couple hundred times more impressions than Land's End because there's a couple hundred more times employees. And while you might want the bigger company to get more, <laughs> you don't want them to get hundreds of times more. You know, and as a result, what often happens if you're not careful is those big companies suck up a big portion of the budget. Data I've seen is that the top 10% can take up as much as 85% of the budget. So it's hard to kind of reach the other guys if you're not careful. And then the third challenge is, okay, I've got the account. I've got to get my ad in front of the right person in that account. And the way you typically think about doing that is, you know, trying to onboard B2B data. Like I want to target VPs of marketing. Problem is that data really is not very good. So, uh, and, you know, in terms of the match rates of onboarding B two B data, and second, it's not very accurate. There are a lot of VPs and marketing at companies that aren't people I want to be selling to. And so, how do you really get your ad in front of the right person in front of the buying committee? What we do is we're also tracking the intent. And so, if we see the specific cookie that has high intent for our products you know, that's the person we're going to bid on because we think they're much more likely to be the member of our buying committee. So there's some interesting nuances there that I didn't appreciate before that I think actually make the difference in terms of this stuff really driving ROI. Yeah. Brian asked a great question here about uh, the engagement of the buying committee. And I'm going to add a, another dimension to that. We're all right now, uh, for the most part, working remotely. Uh, for, I don't know, uh, two, two more weeks to flatten the curve. Uh, I don't know what two weeks those are, but um, uh, it's, it's pretty challenging to reach people right now. And we're, most of us are marketers on the selling side. It's really, really challenging to get people on the phone or just to engage. Um, are you, you or anybody, are, are you guys seeing any trends to successfully engage people? And if so, what, what's working or what's not? Uh, from that engagement, you kind of—I think you kind of said that right there at the end, John, with the high intent with the cookie and the advertising. But are there any other tactics or techniques that are working there? And this question, really, if, if I if I'm understanding Brian's question, is it is it about reaching all the members of the buying committee? Yeah, across uh, you know more deals is still being lost to status quo than closing deals, right? I mean, I, I find that in my business, especially with borderline new concept, new paradigm. Yeah. A lot of education, a lot of, and it, you know, a very long sales cycle, uh, seven figure deals. So yeah, I'd yeah. be curious. Uh, I, I'm going to have to sort of lean on the, you know, wisdom of the crowd here a little bit, you know, because I mean, clearly advertising is, is helping there. Um, you know, we do, I mean, we do do uh, our, ourselves with demand base. Um, a lot of kind of pillaring within the account. So if we see an account that is an MQA, <clears throat> uh, we're, not, we're not calling, at that point we're call, we are calling, but we're not calling just one or two people. You know, we, we are really trying to see, hey, can we touch a lot of different folks? Um, and even if we get a no from one or two people, we're gonna still try politely to touch some other personas because sure. somebody is showing interest. You know, some, and, and You're exactly and, right. Yeah. 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 Somebody's well, showing interest, but where the challenge becomes is that it's, it's easier to say, you know what, it's not the right time. Uh, yeah. Right. Than to make that quote unquote risky decision. Totally I'm literally totally. going to be changing my company based on this decision. Yeah. That's it. So that's why, I mean, again, for me, I, I do come back. Yeah, to I'm talking about a highly considered purchase, not a, a commodity product. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, we actually expand our, when an account is in an opportunity stage, we expand the, the targeting, um, the ad targeting the account to try to hit more personas, you know, because we know we're, there's no chance we're going to talk to everybody. So, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So just how do we at least inoculate somebody from saying demand base, who are those guys, you know? Uh, <laughs> so there's some of that. I will say though, I also miss one of my favorite tactics, you know, used to be, um, I have a really bad name for it, but direct mail was splash damage, uh, you know, which is where you would send a package to an office, you know, and like to a person, but then it would have like the ability to touch lots of people in the account. So, you know, like the classic thing where, you know, we'd send a copy of the book and something nice to the CMO, but there's a whole box of cookies too. And they're not getting out the cookies themselves, the cookies go in the office and then the kitchen with the man based logo. You know, so I, I do miss being able to do some of those types of tactics, you know, that took advantage of people being in person. But you did have um, just building on your Marketo co-founding there, you built a community uh, that still thrives today. Um, and Brian, I don't know if your solution plays well into that community aspect, but it seems like a lot of buyers right now are, are looking for that community of peers to kind of compare notes. Uh, maybe there's a way to somehow look at that as an aspect too, to, to get some sort of engagement. I don't know. And Brian, another thing I'm seeing is, is companies with, you know, sort of large solutions and like you said, sort of transformational um, types of, of uh, um, things that they're selling, actually finding ways to take a page from the product led growth people, right. And saying, how do I start really small? How do I start with some kind of pilot or proof of concept or something that's low risk and easy to say yes to? Um, exactly. And I'm seeing that in some <laughs> unlikely yeah. companies, like places where you know their their long term opportunity is massive, but their short term ability to get to yes is really it's hard. So no, I'm smiling, Megan. Thank you. Yeah, I'm smiling yeah. because uh, that's yeah. exactly in the last six months what we pivoted to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, that strategy we're. Uh, into our fourth proof of concept right now. So it's interesting. We're, the jury's still out, but it's, it's, it's encouraging. The, the piece that I'm seeing um, companies struggle with on that front a bit is finding a proof of concept that shows enough impact, right? So it's, and, and isn't too hard to deploy. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the, you know, with product-led growth, the nice thing is like somebody signs up and companies have architected a lot of those solutions in a way that they get to value really quickly. Um, so the question is for these more complex solutions, especially if they're services dependent and expensive, even in, in then it's thinking about, well, what's going to get that person to impact faster and really packaging it in a way that it's, you know, easy to say yes, because we used to always joke about, you know, half the time, you know, most of your losses are to Mr. or Ms. no decision. Um, exactly. And yeah. how do you get past that with something that's really easy yeah. to say yes to? Yeah, we're lucky we don't have that problem. We're, we're able to demonstrate that you can power devices without any pads or wires. So when someone sees that, that my cell phone is basically yeah. getting power over the air, like, wow. So yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, no, it's a great question though. I do yeah. really oh. actually like John's conversation about, about community. Um, and I sort of wish I'd thought of that myself a second ago. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, I mean, it's, and it's, 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 it's not just your own, like if you want to influence the broader buying committees, right? It's not just, you know, your own community. You know, but it's it's that virtual community. It's 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 you know what are people saying on LinkedIn and group and se sessions like this, right? Um, and and that's where just nurturing your customers and your influencer relationships become so important, uh, which ties back to you know you can say this brand, but it's the stuff, the stuff is all connected. And that's a that great point. Um, so, so John, before we uh, we wrap up, I know we're we're at time. Um, what's one trend you're really excited about in the market right now? It's something that you're seeing that you're really excited about and think could be, you know, a, a drive a lot of impact for the community, for the B two B community. Um, okay, well, I didn't pretty think of a good answer for that one. So, I mean, I. <laughs> It might be recency effect, but, you know, personally, I have been thinking a lot about kind of this, the, you know, the impact of brand and buzz and community and all those factors on, on demand gen and kind of ABM effectiveness, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, may, maybe, may, you know, maybe it's, you know, increasing, an increasing realization that all this stuff is connected. 
you know, and if your demand gen is going great, maybe it's because your brand is really good, you know, and vice versa. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, well, thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. We were lucky to have you um, fit us in and, and definitely excited to get your point of view on all things account-based. Um, I, I like ABX. I think it's a cool acronym myself. <laughs> um, and thanks to everybody too for joining us today. And we hope you'll um, you'll join us again next week. John Russo, who's our guest next week? Uh, next week, Jen Lever from Bizarre Voice. And she just won an award on account-based marketing uh, or ABX. I, I like ABX too because it's very inclusive. And I think that's <laughs> yeah. where, where we need to head. Uh, I would violently agree with you on that. The um, uh, So next week should be great. Uh, Jen is a very insightful, she runs the ABM program at Bizarre Voice. So I think she'll have some really unique insights from a practitioner perspective. So hopefully same time, same place, hopefully you can join us. All right, thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. Have a great rest of the day.